Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. A lot of my fellow atheists get so irritated at me when I say that I don't think we can effectively change minds without involving emotion. And they're like, no, no, this is about logic. It's facts. It's data. They hear emotion and they think manipulation. And I'm not talking about manipulating people, especially in a malicious way. I'm talking about engaging the heart as we engage the brain. Psychologist Dr. Lawrence Reed talks about how even our facial expressions might change whether or not people accept us, receive us, believe us, even give us the time of day. This is huge. Dr. Reed's Wondrium series is so good on this. It's called Understanding Human Emotions. Just one of thousands of vetted, credible, engaging series streaming right to you, including on the Wondrium app, ad-free and so amazing. And right now with my special URL, you can see what I'm talking about with a free and full month Total access, the entire library for one month using wondrium.com slash Seth. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Seth. Get your free month. Do it now. Wondrium.com slash Seth. What the hell is going on in Texas? Now, actually, I have this conversation about many states in our union. I'm calling it a union because it seems like the United States is actually two warring nations. I want to talk, though, specifically about Texas with Texans. And so I have Aaron Ra. He is an activist, producer, author, legend. I've got Will Judy. State Director of American Atheists. You're still State Director, is that correct, for Texas, Will? That's me, yes. And I've got Michelle Palmer. She is a teacher, and she is a former candidate for the Texas State Board of Education. And she ran as a secular person. I got to start there, Michelle. You announced out loud, I'm not religious. I would like to run for Texas State Board of Education. Pretty much. Um, If you look at my ballotpedia, which has religion on it, mine says secular humanist. You know, we have pretty open conversations in my classroom and my students know that I am not religious and many of them are not religious. I teach high school and it seems like uh, about a third of my students, and this is in a completely black and brown school, are not religious. Now, this is a taxpayer funded public school? That is correct. So you talk about your own positions. Does that get sticky at all when you are speaking personally about your position, whether it's politically, religiously, or whatever? Because I teach social studies and I have to teach about all of the religions and all of the political persuasions and so forth, I do a lot of uh, class discussion and I do a, I, my, I need to be open with my students. It's a big part of who I am. You well, know, sure. My, I think what I'm asking, though, is yeah. like we're no, telling religious yeah. people, well, you can't mm-hmm. proselytize. You know, yeah. how much of the classroom is about you personally mm-hmm. and your positions, philosophies, et cetera. You're not telling people what they should think. But if they ask, you tell them what you think. Is that fair? That is fair. OK. Um, and, you know, my students, they have questions and so forth. And I'm pretty honest about myself. So when you ran... Don't you have to have God on a resume in Texas? Isn't that like a requirement? Like to run, 
don't you have to wave the banner of Jesus? And did they use that against you whenever you were running? The Texas Constitution actually requires that you believe in God to run for office. Um, Now, that's unconstitutional, as we know, but it, it is in the Constitution. I would say, you know, amongst a certain group of Texans, yes, you kind of have to wave the Jesus banner. But I mean, I don't run on that party. And in the other party, it's a little less important, I would say. Aaron Ra, what did you run for? Remind me. I ran for uh, Texas State Senate. And uh, th- I knew that I, there was no chance that I was going to be elected, but it, it was just frustrating to me that no- normally in this district, it's just Republicans running a primary against each other. They never have anybody else run against them. And so what you end up with election after election is two conservative Christian Republicans, each accusing the other of being Satan. <laughs> Well, one look at you, and they must have gotten distracted, at least for a moment. <laughs> I just picture, you no, know, we've all seen those rubber stamped political ads go, you know. John Doe is a man of the people. He came from nothing, and he worked his fingers to the bone to become a success in the great state of Texas. He's a man of faith, obligatory shot of John Doe in a church pew with his family. Da da da, and the music plays. He loves God, and he loves Texas, and he loves America. So I'm trying to picture you running against that in the state of Texas. Well, this guy's platform, his primary issue was to make sure that trans people couldn't pee. I'm sorry. That I just, was, I'm sorry. I, hang that on. That was his platform. Like, was he this about the have, transgender bathrooms? <laughs> he wanted people checking IDs in public restrooms. He, he wanted police to be checking people's IDs to get into a public restroom in like any restaurant anywhere. And so I thought this would be great. I'm not going to get I'm not going to win this election. But if I can get a debate with this guy, that would be hilarious because, of course, he's a young earth creationist, doesn't know fuck all about anything. And it would have been it would have been great to get on. Did, wait, is this the guy who won? The guy that always wins. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, uh, I was told that when I started, when I ran I was told that you would need $35,000 to start with and build up your money from there. Whereas if I was running for a similar office in the UK, I would be capped at 35,000 pounds. You can only spend up to that much. And so that's where I see a fundamental problem with American politics. And this guy, my opponent, at the onset of the election, was given a check for $2 million for his campaign. Were you a Satanist? at that no. time or was that did that come later it just as good as i mean i've been accused of being a satanist since i was 11 <laughs> okay all right yeah. <laughs> uh, well i know you you're affiliated with the satanic temple well yeah but that, I would that vote, was very recent that's that's within the last two years i would vote for will judy for public office i don't know will i know you're a leader right you're one of those natural leaders so will have you run for office of any kind i have not um i've thought about it and i almost did almost Kind of almost ran for the Texas Senate in my area, but I haven't found a position that is worth me running. I had to envision me in the seat and, hey, what kind of change can I affect with that position? And I just think I would hate campaigning. I think I would. I just I see it. I know my personality. But again, if it's a means to an end, then I'm all in. I just wanted to throw out that I was in politics just long enough to know that I don't want to be in politics. Yeah, I, I concur with Will when he says that he wouldn't like campaigning. I hated it. Okay. Because it's all it is is asking for money. Right. Will I, hate asking for, I hate asking for money. And I would love the debate part. I would love putting a spotlight on running as an open secular humanist, open atheist, whatever. I want to have a spotlight on it in the world, generally in Texas specifically. But uh, again, I'm still thinking about it. I have absolutely not ruled it out. But I'm, I'm I'm always looking for something to run for, but haven't found it yet. And uh, but Aaron, I, I give you mad props for running when there is no one else running for that position, knowing that it's a super red area. I know other people that have done it and uh, have uh, nothing but respect for y'all. Will tell me about the specific types of activism right now in Texas. You got Governor Abbott; he is looming above all. It's like the Death Eater that has come to suck away everyone's soul. Am I exaggerating, Will? 
so I don't know how, I mean, maybe that part but uh, he's suck yeah they're all sucking they're sucking something uh and it's not just Abbott in Texas I've learned I'm really new to the political stuff uh but in Texas it's kind of like a three-headed monster governor lieutenant governor and attorney general they they kind of run the show and their sycophants their crew does the rest in the legislature so it's a lot of work, a lot of work, but they're over, they being the people you just described and I just described, uh, they're overrepresented in the Texas legislature. They don't represent who Texas is and what Texas is, is a non-voting state. I mean, you can count on half of the registered voters not voting. And with that, you get the representation that we currently see in Texas and uh, people like Michelle and I and our, our, all of us on the screen are working to uh, fix just that. If, if I was ever going to run for, for another office, uh, it would be Board of Education, even though I know it's an unpaid position. It would be it would be quite taxing and it would be a lot of work for no pay, but it would still be, I think, symbolically important, perhaps, that I be on the board after fighting against the board for so long. Michelle Palmer, tell me about the school boards. There has been a concentrated effort by evangelicals, many who are well-funded and highly organized. And they're saying, we need to jam in. We need to actually stuff the school boards with Christian nationalists. Can you flesh that out for me? Sure. So there's several layers of school board here in the, in the state of Texas. There are the district school boards, um, which is where a lot of that is happening. Several of the suburban school districts in Harris County, where I live, the Houston area, have fallen to um, the Christian nationalist insanity. They are banning books left and right. They are trying to do, you know, they're they're like frothing at the mouth for these things about every school, have every classroom having the Ten Commandments prominently displayed and requiring the Bible or other religious texts to be read in class, things like that. They're just waiting for these things to be passed because they're so excited about it. And what's super sad to me about it is that, you know, they are white nationalists as well as Christian nationalists. And many of these districts, because we are Texas, we are a very diverse state, you know, are majority black and brown students. And they're having to be represented and be controlled or have their education controlled by these horrible people. And then there's the State Board of Education, which is what I ran for. And they're the ones who tell teachers what to teach. So they're the ones that create the standards that we teach in social studies or science or whatever subject it is. Social studies and science being the ones who that generally bring the controversy, of course. And I know that in um, about 10 years ago now, there was a documentary made about the Texas State Board of Education called The Revisionaries because they liked to revise history and science so much. The cover of it has dinosaurs on Noah's Ark. As was mentioned earlier, many young earth creationists on the board. Sanity had been gaining a little bit of traction, but then, of course, last year we had redistricting, which took away some of that sanity and made the board go back in the other direction again with very, very gerrymandered districts that are virtually unwinnable. For those watching from the outside in, we talk about gerrymandering quite a bit, but define it for those who aren't familiar with what gerrymandering is, if you would, Michelle. Of course. Um, so I'm a government teacher. This should be easy for me. Okay. Um, gerrymandering. So when you redistrict, you are looking at the census data that happens every 10 years and you are redrawing the lines of all the different districts from school boards and city councils all the way up to Congress to make the districts more equal in size. And gerrymandering uh, was actually named after a person that did it 150 years ago or whatever, is to make those districts as favorable for your party as possible. And now with computers, that can be done down to the block. And so what is generally done is what's called cracking and packing which is where you cram as many of the other party into districts as possible. We have 80, 85% Democratic districts in the city here in the Houston area. 
and then spread the Republican voters into as many districts as possible. So Texas generally votes about 54, 46 Republican. So definitely Republican, but not overwhelmingly. But about two thirds of our elected officials, two thirds of our Congress members, two thirds of our state legislators, more than two thirds of our state senators are Republican because of the way that redistricting is done in the state of Texas. Interesting to watch the districts that have been gerrymandered. It's like abstract art. They sort of spider out in all these bizarre ways. And you realize this is by design, right? They want to lock out the opposition. Maybe that explains how people like Marjorie Taylor Greene and others get elected. I don't know. That's another conversation. Aaron, back to the textbooks in Texas public schools. Was it true that they used to teach that Moses was a real guy? Am One I remembering that? One of our Texas that? history books that was proposed said that the United States government and or our legal system was based on a covenant between God and Moses, which we the, the Board of Education knew that that was false. There were a couple of uh, history professors that had come in from the East to give testimony, to give specific quotations from the founding fathers to the effect that that they were based on uh, Greek democracy and enlightenment. And there was one that specifically said that we were, that it was not influenced by the Ten Commandments at all. And there was a quote specifically saying that from one of the founding fathers. The type of government the United States has was designed to be purposefully the very opposite of the type of government that is commonly associated with Moses. The Board of Education knows that. They know that it is fact where they I'm talking about the people that were taking our testimony. They knew that what they were teaching was not factual, that it was wrong, but they said they openly admitted that they are going to teach American exceptionalism, that they had to have the kids believe that America was a blessed nation only because we were founded on God's principles. And as long as we stay by God's principles, then our country will remain blessed. They want to lot tell this lie to the kids. And it doesn't matter that they know that it's not really true. They said in the Board of Education, the, the chairman of the board at that time said that we can't teach anything that would be embarrassing. So they, they wanted to make sure that they did not teach civil rights issues. They wanted to make sure that they did not, that they didn't even teach about slavery. They wanted to remove Thomas Jefferson and replace him with Jefferson Davis who ironically advocated that the the whole purpose for the Civil War was slavery, not states' rights, but they're still arguing that it should be states' rights, that that's what the Civil War was about. One of our history teach one of our history books actually said that it, it described the slaves as immigrant workers who benefited by adopting Christianity. Typical history book written by white people. Uh, or white nationalists, rather. Will Judy, there's a book out by Catherine Stewart called The Power Worshippers, and she asserts that much of this isn't about theology. It's not about personal faith. It's not about Jesus, etc. It's about weaponizing religion for power. 100%. And they see the demographic changes. I'm just going to focus on Texas. They see the demographic changes happening in Texas, which is easy to see that it's getting more black and brown. So they're going to lose their power as a result uh, is with their calculation. And so they're, they're doing things now to hold on to this power as long as possible. So they know that and eventually they'll be phased out, but they just want to delay that as much as they can. And religious freedom has been a more of a shield of protection in generations past, but they've turn that shield into a sword. I borrowed that from uh, from our friend uh, Andrew Seidel. That is a very apt description of what they're doing. So religious freedom, used, again, used to protect people, but now they're using it to impose their views on a population for the purpose of holding on to power, again, as long as possible. I love watching these people lose their, I mean, I don't love it, but I find it fascinating and amusing and interesting to watch them lose their minds over things like a black little mermaid, right? I mean, of all the things going on in the world, oh no, we have a protagonist of a fairy tale and we have representation 
and they call it an attack on white people or American heritage. Yeah, it's it's an affront to their privilege. Uh, when you grow up explicitly and implicitly told that this is your country, this is your space, you are the ruler of everything you see, you can move about as you wish. When there's any challenge to that, it's pearls are clutched and they get very uncomfortable with that notion. And a lot of people don't even know it. They, they kind of don't, they can't intellectualize why they're getting so upset that there is a black or brown little mermaid, or now there's uh, these people they don't agree with on their beer cans. What's the, the phrase? Uh, equality feels like oppression to the privileged. I'm yeah. paraphrasing, but yeah, I that's, that's, that's we see it every day. And it's it's just getting more and more obvious, getting louder and louder. And um, and that's something that, again, all four of us are fighting against. Ten years ago, the Board of Education was saying in this weird language that they can't teach the you know civil rights issues because that was embarrassing. And they can't teach slavery because that was embarrassing. They can't teach anything racial at all because all of that was embarrassing. And then somebody published the critical race theory and the, the Board of Education and uh, the Republican religious right basically adopted that name, not the actual thing that is not being taught in schools, by the way. They just adopted the name critical race theory because it fit what they were trying to censor. So when they say that they when they used to say that they can't teach about slavery and they can't teach about civil rights because both of those imply that we are not divinely guided, they've now taken the label of that they've taken the name of that and applied that to this other thing. So now they're calling it critical race theory and they're pretending as if if we know what our forefathers did that somehow we will personally be ashamed or hateful of ourselves. It's like teaching how to hate white people, which of course it's not. Yeah, I'm fully aware of what what people what the United States has done to blacks, to Jews, to the Irish, to women, to Native Americans, to the Japanese, to the Chinese, to Mexicans living in this country after the Civil War. I'm fully aware of the, the atrocities my country has visited on its own people. If you want to know how bad things can get, just look at how bad they've already been. But if you have this illusion that we've always been perfect and things like this can't happen, that's how things like this happen. More to come in just a second. I want to talk about making America great again. Apparently, we were great. Now we're not great. We have to return to great what do these people mean? I will ask my panel of guests next. Today we're talking Texas as it relates to the rest of the country. My special guests are in raw. Will Judy and Michelle Palmer, all activists and all Texans. Michelle Palmer, I'm interested in a clip I saw by one of my favorite actors, Brian Cranston, Walter White from Breaking Bad. And he was just speaking to his values about MAGA, make America great again. And he had a great point because if you ask someone, well, when was that? Like, when, when were we great? Or well, what specific decade? Quite often you will hear the 1950s, the golden age. Yes. So, uh, so when I teach U.S. history, you know, I have to teach the Texas version of that U.S. history, which, you know, y'all were talking earlier, and this is from world history standards, but I wanted to read this to you. This is literally in the standards you have to teach for world history. Identify examples of American ideals that have advanced human rights and democratic ideas throughout the world. That is literally something that the world history teacher that I'm a mentor for has to teach next week. But you know, there is a lot of American exceptionalism in the standards that we have to teach as social studies teachers here in the state of Texas. And, you know, when I'm teaching government and I have to teach about the 2016 and 2020 elections, you know, my students have a lot of opinions about this. And so they're very interested and they get it really energetic during the discussions and so forth. And, you know, they want to hear about the fact that you know, they, I try to leave my personal politics out of my government class 
and let them come to their own decisions. Um, I never try to sway them in any way. I often even take the other side and argue with them just to make sure they can flesh out their own arguments. And, you know, when one of them will point out that, you know, Make America Great Again is a play on Hitler's motto when he ran, you know, make Germany great again, which was basically the German, that in German is basically his motto. It's very challenging teaching the Texas version of history in a classroom that is not full of white students because they know they have experienced, they have lived what it is to be a Texan who is not white. They experience racism. They are not big fans of our former president. Um, <laughs> during, during the 2020 election, Joe Biden came to a building literally next door to my campus and gave a speech. And while he was there, those lovely MAGA trucks that we have in Texas that have the giant flags on the back, there were a hundred of them just circling that building over and over and over again. And my students were freaking out. I mean, if it, look, it feels like a threat. I mean, it, they've got plausible deniability. We're just driving around waving our flags because hashtag freedom. But when you realize who these people are, many of them come from kind of a, a literal weaponized point of view, right? They've been stockpiling, waiting for a holy war on God's democracy. They're capable of anything. Right. That's terrifying. Absolutely. Aaron mentioned something earlier that made me want to point this out. My entire, and Will knows this, my entire reason for running for State Board of Education was because I was looking at the eighth grade U.S. history curriculum, which is the first half of U.S. history, and then I teach the second half in high school. And I realized that if I had been an eighth grade U.S. history teacher, that I would have to teach what he was talking about, Moses as a part of the founding of the United States. Um, and that's the whole reason I, I'm, I'm running, that I run for this position uh, whenever it's up. It's absolutely insane to me some of the things that are in the curriculum to teach history here in the state of Texas. It's funny. I saw a meme that I laughed a little too hard at, and it showed... Uh, bunch of people in big jacked up pickup trucks and there's black smoke billowing out of the exhaust pipe and they're covered in Trump flags and American flags. And the caption is when the extra small condoms go on sale at Walmart. And I just thought it was funny. It just made me laugh out loud. R and raw. Let's talk about this particular culture. They are draped in flags, American flags, Jesus flags, Trump flags, fuck Biden flags, Confederate flags. What's your take? Well, they, they, they're very binary in their thinking. So that has to be us versus them tribalism. And one of the things that bothers me is where I constantly hear that you're either on the right or you're in the far left. Because there can be no left without saying the word radical in front of it. Because Fox News will only talk about the radical leftists. And somehow Biden is counted on the radical left. I had to tell a friend of mine, an old friend of mine, just a couple of days ago that the problem that we on the left have with Biden is that he's not on the left. <laughs> every every well, president in my lifetime, and I'm 60, every president we've ever had has been on the authoritarian right. Now, hang on. Hold on. Let me push back just a little bit. And I'm not I'm not a huge Biden fan, but in terms of his acceptance of LGBT people and the fact that he isn't a Christian nationalist. I mean, we know he's a devout Catholic and he took his oath on a Bible that's, you know, the size of a large cardboard moving box. Did you see that thing? It's massively big Bible <laughs> and whatnot. But as far as inclusion, in terms of being a humanist. I would align him more with liberal values. I mean, that's fair, isn't it? He he is more in line with liberal values than some other presidents have been. But if you go over the course of my 60-year lifespan, uh, JFK was also Catholic and was also you know surprisingly progressive for a Catholic at that time and for a president now. But even he is counted on the authoritarian right. Jimmy Carter, evangelical Christian, 
He's also atypical for an evangelical Christian because, you know, the man is 90 some odd years old building homes for the homeless. How leftist is that? But even he was listed in, in, in the authoritarian right. Kamala Harris had proposed some leftist policy. So we could argue that she's quasi leftist there. And she may be across that boundary because it's not just the far extremes of either side of the political compass. There's four quadrants there because there's two axes. And one of the more important things that people don't look at is that there's the authoritarian and the libertarian. When I say libertarian, I don't mean the right wing political party. I mean the anti-authoritarian ones, those who don't want more. We, I want, I'm, I'm accused of being a statist. I'm accused of worshiping the state when in fact I want less government than the GOP wants to impose. Okay, well, hang on. Hold on. But if Biden is pro-government programs to help minorities, marginalized groups, and the disadvantaged, that's a liberal value. If Biden is against the death penalty, that's a liberal value. Yeah, but I'm, I'm understanding liberal to be more of a centrist position. I mean, if you look at the, no. the political compass... Liberal Are you a liberal? I mean, we can get lost in the weeds all day. Wait, this is all semantics. I know definitions yeah. are all subjective, right? Labels are essentially yeah. how we apply them. But if I, I don't see any comparison, you know, if I look at basic humanistic tendencies, I see that there is no contest. And even though I'm not a huge Biden fan, for me, I'm like, well, for me, it's there's not not even a moment of hesitation. If I'm a humanist, I've got to go in this direction, right? I've got to support Likewise, this Likewise, if, if you're okay. a humanist, you would probably appreciate JFK and Jimmy Carter, but that doesn't sure. change their... It doesn't mean that they're all so far on the right that they, that they become virtual Nazis, you know, because there's a, there's a bit of a range there, just like there is on the left, you know? Bernie Sanders is one tick further left than I am, and he's still he's still a few ticks further to the right of what most self-identified Marxists or socialists would be. This is a whole other show. I'm sorry. Sorry to <laughs> Pam and Will. Sorry. This is a whole other show. I may or may not include that whole section because I feel like we may have to come back and cover all that. Okay. Okay. And you can do that as another show if you just need if you just need source material. I can, all I can get I have a couple of political experts on here. Text Aaron and he'll be ready to rock and roll in 10 minutes. I've never seen somebody who's ready to do a show like you are. It's amazing. Will Judy, you want to talk about the God and guns culture? I mean, if there's any state other than Oklahoma, Arkansas, Florida, I guess, it's Texas. But I think God and guns. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, I can I can talk about it. I was curious about that myself. Uh, I realized I was kind of in my own bubble and hanging out with my own people for too long. So I started talking to other people, other bubbles, and people like me that lived in deep red Texas and had for a while. So I just, I'll just ask them questions. And what I learned is that in, uh, let's just say East Texas, but I think you can extrapolate that to most of rural Texas, they love their rugged individualism. We have that nationwide, but crank that up five notches. And that's what Texas is. They love the fact they want small government. They don't want government telling them what to do. They want to have their AR-15s to shoot their javelinas and, and, or just because that rugged individualism is cranked up again, justified by God and Moses and just myth upon layer of myth upon myth upon myth. But the narrative is that, well, we have to, well, first of all, God gave me the right because of the second amendment. That's a whole other conversation, but it These is. people are also saying that the government that's the greatest government in the history of history may rise up against them and they have to be prepared in case of a coup. Yeah, it was the, the, these militia types are the ones who were involved in the attempted coup. I do want to mention something that Will had talked about a moment ago when he was talking about how they want less government. They don't want government to intrude. And yet what they want is anti-trans bills. Texas leads the state in anti-trans bills. The Satanic Temple wanted to hold Sa SatanCon in Dallas. American Atheists, you, you and I both sit on the board of directors for American Atheists. They wanted to hold the 2024 uh, National Convention in Dallas because we're on track for the, the eclipse. Both organizations said, no, Texas is too dangerous because we have trans people who might be arrested for standing on stage addressing an audience. 
because we have so many ridiculous laws. They try to pass anti-sodomy laws here. They did pass the Merry Christmas bill, which was designed to out non-Christian teachers to their students. And then they tried to pass the show your papers bill where police would just randomly identify suspicious people or whatever person they decide looks suspicious, probably more often will than myself, if you know what I mean. And then grab people and just make sure that they have their papers showing that they're in the States legally. And if you don't have your papers on you, you will be apprehended. You could be walking, you would be caught walking across a college campus and pulled off because you didn't show your papers, which sounds to me an awful lot like what proud patriotic Americans used to describe when they were talking about how bad it is to live in Russia. Well, now we're there. And the people who used to say that are now learning to speak Russian because that's their hero now. They want to put the Ten Commandments in all classrooms. Oh, yes, rugged individualism where the government doesn't tell you what to do, but it does tell you what kind of sex you cannot have, what kind of people you can't have it with, and what religions you can't believe in. Michelle Palmer, you ever feel like one of the handmaids in Gilead? Oh, I I actually have a handmaid's costume that I protest on the, the streets with on occasion. Under um, his eye. Blessed be the fruit. Exactly. All that. <laughs> it definitely is feeling more and more like Gilead uh, pretty much every day here in the state of Texas. Um, you know, I teach seniors and I've had a lot of conversations with my female students, especially about you know, they don't feel safe here. They don't want to go to college here, trying to find them colleges that, that they can get into that are not in a red state. We have these conversations on a regular basis, and um, it makes me sad and angry every single time I have to have those conversations because, you know, I almost moved uh, out of state to a blue state for that exact reason, but I refuse to let them take my state away from me. This is my state. I am just as Texan as the Trump flag waving crazies that I see on my way home. And I refuse to let them take from me what I love. And we will take it back eventually. But they're they, some of the stuff they are passing, or at least looking at passing, is just absolutely crazy. One of the bills is a $25,000 stipend to teachers who are willing to be armed, quote, sentinels on campus. $25,000 stipend. First of all, I don't trust a single person in this building to have a weapon. I love my fellow teachers, but no, I don't want that. This all sounds very Sean Hannity. The best way to prevent school shootings is to have more guns. Do you remember when Sean Hannity said that had he been in that uh, nightclub in Las Vegas when the sniper from some unidentified tower from some hidden window across the street or maybe two or three buildings away, he's got a completely concealed position. Nobody can see him, but he's picking out people in the crowd with his high powered rifles. Sean Hannity said that if he had his nine millimeter or whatever the hell it was that he carries his penis extension in his back pocket, that if he'd been there. He could have saved everybody somehow. Okay, I look at a map of Texas, like a voting map, and I see uh, I see more blue than I would expect to see in Texas. What's that about? We're going to talk about it after this. If you would like this show commercial-free and you'd like it two days early and you'd like to support your humble host, please consider becoming a patron. You can just choose your level of support and you can go to patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Talking now with Michelle Palmer, Will Judy and Aaron Raw, three Texas activists. Will Judy, is Texas almost a blue state? You, I know you've got blue pockets, right? The numbers are closer than one might expect. Yeah, there we see it. Michelle and I see it. And I know we've been talking about the ills of both Texas and the nation this whole time. And my energy has been, okay, I, I get all of this. What do we do about it? And that's kind of where I come in. My energy is to do something about this bullshit. And there's, there's two ways I want to do it. A, a political arm and a changing hearts and minds. And the political arm, they get to do this because they're overrepresented in the legislature. 
Why are they overrepresented? It's because their side votes and consistently has voted. And then the more power they get, the more they get to redistrict, they get to gerrymander, they get to suppress the vote, and as well as two generations of misinformation, which is goes into voter suppression. So there's a whole side of Texas that just doesn't care. They don't give a shit. And I want them to give a shit and change the makeup and dilute out the bullshit that's in the Texas legislature. So that's kind of my what I'm trying to do in multiple ways. It's just it's more than get out the vote. Uh, voting is everyone that's going to listen to the show, I can bet is going to vote. And that's great. That's but that's basic. Um, I'm trying to teach people the extra things you can do that everyone can do to affect change. You can do it from the privacy of your own home. And there's multiple ways you can help do something about this. When Dodds went away, so many people were like, oh, Roe v. Wade is gone. I wish there was something I can do. Well, there is something you can do. It's going to take a while. And part of this is just teaching people you have to have patience. It's going to take two, three, five election cycles to really see change happen. But it has to start now. Otherwise, uh, they win. You've led me into kind of my final cap of the show. Can you give me a few specifics? Because this applies far beyond Texas. What can we do? Yes, um, it's a whole list of things I've, I've come up with in the short time I've been in this world. My group, Secular Houston, we vet candidates here in, the, in, the, in Houston. We endorse people and basically we say, hey, these this list of people aligns with our values. So separation of church and state, OK with non-belief, fidelity and science, that kind of thing. We vetted them. We did the work. These people align with our values. Fucking get them elected. And just that, if you just send them five dollars a month, if you go out door knocking for them, you tell your friends about them and kind of lean on your friends. Hey, these people are great. Uh, Let's get them elected. These friends who otherwise would not vote now vote. That is how we affect change. And that's if every all the listeners do that, that's where the grassroots comes in. One blade of grass isn't going to do it, but multiple blades of grass. That's that's grassroots activism. Find someone that you you want to give a shit about and give them energy. That energy is in the form of money or time. The hard part is knowing who you like. And that's kind of why I said I'm doing the work. If you align with, if you want the world to look like I want it to look like, fucking get these people elected. So that is, again, I'm, I'm doing the work for people. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible. The Ten Commandments bill coming through, it, it passed the Senate, now it's in the Texas House. I'm trying to teach people, all right, it's in the Texas House. This is where we can, quote, kill the bill. This is what you can do to lean on your local representatives to put pressure on them. If everyone that's in earshot in Houston does that, and bonus, if you tell them you're secular, now these representatives are realize, oh, these secular people are watching and they exist and they care about what we're doing. It's been a void before in this area, but I'm teaching people how to make our voice heard and officially run record. We being secular people paying attention to politics and leaning on them with time as we're going to be uh, a voting block. We're going to be a force here locally. I, I like when it's possible for us to give testimony before the state house. I've done that before. Working on it. Yep. Um, uh, we have a with American atheist. We have a, sec, a statewide advocacy team that is making noise in Austin and the legislature. And this is a very active time. This session is in session is going on now and where you can give a, a testimony. And unfortunately, they give you a really small window, like with a date in advance. And it, if they make it as hard, they make it really uh, difficult. But I we're looking for uh, someone physically in the Austin San Antonio area. They can just up and go give testimony. Because uh, physical testimony in front of the committee is actually very powerful. I like the idea where we don't just curse the darkness, right? We got to spread some light. I know it's a cliche, but it's also true. Michelle Palmer, how can people get involved? Just about every major city in Texas has an education advocacy group of some sort. Here in Houston, we have Community Voices for Public Education. Dallas has one as well. And you know, those are there to help specifically about education related bills. And Will was so amazingly eloquently talking about, you know, all the the things you can do. And you cannot forget those education positions, because whoever controls education, especially what the teachers teach, is going to control the narrative and the ability of students and in the future to critically think and reason for themselves. 
right? Literally, the Texas GOP platform from 2022 had a plank against critical thinking skills in in high school. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry. Against critical thinking. They Thank posted you. the same thing in 2012. We yeah. are against critical thinking. We are against teaching higher order thinking skills that would challenge the parental authority and students' fixed beliefs. Parental right. rights. That's the new catchphrase. They use that language. I, I'm not calling anybody a liar. I'm just saying they said, we don't want people to critically think. Literally, exactly. those words are in their platform. So if we do not take back the State Board of Education, I don't even know how long it's been since we had control of it, but it's been a long time, you know, then they control all of that. They control it and, and make it so that our voting percentage is the lowest in the country. Texas has the lowest percentage of turnout in the country. Hmm. And it's because our education system is not good. We do not teach our students how to register to vote, that they have to register to vote, how to go vote, how to find out where to go vote, how to look up candidates and figure out which one of them best fits you. It's horrifying. We we require teaching of government to graduate high school, but it's not a great curriculum. Maybe they just have been watching Ted Cruz and they faced palm themselves into unconsciousness. And that's why we haven't seen them at the polls. Someone explain. I, I got to finish the show. Someone explain Ted Cruz to me. Like, aren't Texans even looking at this guy going, wow, that human costume must be really uncomfortable, right? I mean, does Texas like Ted Cruz? How is he still in there? I've never met anyone who liked Ted Cruz. Ted Cruz's family doesn't like Ted Cruz. And, and uh, there was a senator, Al Franken, who said that I like Ted Cruz more than my Republican associates like Ted Cruz, and I hate Ted Cruz. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's end with pro action. I've talked to the other two guests. Aaron Raw, what would you encourage people to do to be a part of a solution in Texas or beyond? Well, I, I I do a show, you know, the Raw Men podcast is all about uh, celebrating people who, who actually are doing something, right? And I had to become an activist. I had to be involved myself. I had to give testimony. I started my, my YouTube channel just so that I could give small snippets of information to people that I knew were misinformed by the religious right, by the propaganda machine. So I'm using the, the social media network to get out the, the, the information that you can look up and verify in a moment. Be physically on the steps of the state capitol, holding a picket sign. I've done that over and over again. And people do need to be directly involved. If you can run for public office, do so. I would love to see Will's face on a political poster. Wouldn't that be? Look at that. Would it, <laughs> the man, he's not the hero we deserve, but he is the hero we need. Will <laughs> Judy, you would have my vote. Like I would, Absolutely. I would sneak into Texas and fake citizenship to vote for you. Well, Don't I'm say just... that; they'll take you seriously. <laughs> R. N. Raw, Will Judy, and Michelle Palmer—three Texas secular people who are on the front lines for education, for advocacy, for humanism, for state church separation, and for sanity. And I'm so glad for the perspective. I'm so glad you're down there doing the work. Keep us in the loop and let's talk again soon, okay? Thank you for having us on. Yes, thank you. It was a pleasure. Thanks again, Seth. Anytime. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring The Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.